ALL Hub Podcasts, brought to you by Scientific Education Support. Hello and welcome to the ALL Hub Podcast. Today we'll be hearing from Jan Kools from KU Leuven in Belgium. Hello, my name is Jan Kools. I'm a professor at the University of Leuven in Belgium, and I'm also a group leader at the VIB Institute, also here at the same place in Leuven, Belgium. My work is focused on the genetics of acute lymphoblastic leukemia, where we have tried to identify all the genetic defects that are important in the development of this disease. We've gone through many different types of sequencing. There's a lot of technology development that has occurred in the past years. And so we are now up to the level where we can really look into single individual leukemia cells into the genetic changes that occur there. And by these methods, we can also track down what happened over time and how these leukemias developed. Based on that genetic information, my lab has also explored the function of these uh, oncogenes that we identify by developing cell models or mouse models to try to identify exactly what each of these oncogenes are doing. Now, based on that work, and of course, also the work of many other colleagues uh, in the field, we have now trying to get a complete picture of how acute lymphoblastic leukemia develops in uh, individuals. We already know for quite some time that even before birth in uh, developing embryos, sometimes the first genomic changes can already occur in the blood cells of the embryos that develop. And then only much later on after birth, even when these individuals are five to 10 years of age, only then sometimes leukemia develops really. And so that that already illustrates that there's a very long time needed, or there can be a very long time needed before the first changes in the genome occur uh, in the first cells. And then later on, by accumulating additional mutations, only leukemia develops many years later. That shows to us, and also by the fact that we need all these different mutations to drive leukemia development. So leukemia, ALL development, similar to other types of leukemia, is not driven by just one change in the genome, but many different changes are needed in the genome before a normal cell is transformed into a leukemia cell. We typically think that about 10 to 20 different types of genetic changes are needed. And so with all that information together, we believe that what happens is a first mutation or change occurs in one of the cells, which can be in a young child or even before birth, as I mentioned before. And these cells do not change that much by this first mutation, one or two mutations, one or two changes in the genome. These cells may become more um, proliferative, proliferate a little bit more, cycle a little bit more so they make more cells with the same mutation, but that by itself will not trigger leukemia development. But over the years, these same cells may accumulate additional genetic changes over and over again, a few more, a few years later, again, one or more uh, additional changes, and that will eventually then might trigger leukemia development. So because this process is a kind of a stepwise process where each mutation occurs after each other, this also gives the cells a um, opportunity to accumulate different mutations. And that's what we now see also at the diagnosis of patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, when we look to individual leukemia cells in the same patient, we do see that sometimes different mutations are present, different genetic changes are present in different cells. There are always a number of changes that are common, and we believe that these are the first mutations that occurred in these cells. But we then also see that later on, maybe additional changes can occur in one cell, and another cell can acquire other changes. And that gives a kind of a um, a view that there is a branched evolution of these leukemia cells. And that happens all over a period of a few years time uh, during the development of these leukemias. That makes it clear that at diagnosis, then often these leukemias are so quite heterogeneous. Not every cell is the same. Sometimes there are different mutations present in these cells, and that may also lead to different responses to treatment. So this heterogeneity that we observe in these leukemia cells might definitely also have a consequence on the treatment. And sometimes maybe all these cells are very sensitive to the chemotherapy treatment that the patient receives, but maybe some of these mutations might uh, render the cells more, more uh, resistant or so less sensitive to the therapy and might result in a relapse later on. And so it's important to characterize this heterogeneity that we see in these cells 
at diagnosis. Another question that we can try to address is what is actually now the cell of origin of acute lymphoblastic leukemia? Is it a hematopoietic stem cell in the bone marrow or is it already a lymphoid cell, a B cell or a T cell that is more differentiated? And there's some studies that we've done, we and other groups have done uh, to try to mimic that in, in mouse models, to try to mimic this leukemia development in a mouse model. And that might give us some answers into whether these mutations occur in stem cells or whether these changes, these mutations occur later on in more differentiated cells. And I think the answer is not, um, not easy. It's probably also different. Uh, different types of leukemia, or different types of B and T cell ALL might originate from stem cells or maybe uh, also from more differentiated cells. So it's a quite um, complex picture. For some of the mutations that we have introduced in hematopic stem cells in the mouse, we see that these mutations lead to acute lymphoblastic leukemia by themselves. So indicating that, yes, mutations in hematopic stem cells can sometimes lead to very specific types of T cell or B cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. While other mutations would generate all kinds of leukemias when you put them in a stem cell, a myeloid leukemia or a lymphoid leukemia. And so maybe those mutations are acquired later on in the process in more differentiated cells. So it's definitely not completely clear exactly what is the cell of origin. And if some mutations are accumulating in the stem cells or other mutations are accumulating later on. But again, also with the single cell sequencing, we can try to get some answers to that. When we identify or isolate hematopic stem cells from patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia and try to see if these cells already have mutations, then indeed, at least in some patients, we do find mutations in the, stem, in the hematopic stem cells already indicating that those cells are definitely part of the origin of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. But the majority of mutations might accumulate later on and might accumulate in a more differentiated lymphoid cells. And that's why they then give rise to lymphoid leukemias, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, either from B cell origin or T cell origin. Some of these leukemias also have characteristics of myeloid cells. And so indicating that, yes, these mutations in, in those cases definitely have occurred earlier on. And these uh, leukemia cells do not really know yet whether they want to become a lymphoid cell or a myeloid cell. So it's a quite complex picture, but that's probably not so important to know also for the treatment of these patients. What's more interesting is how heterogeneous these leukemias are, if there are many different mutations present and if there is different cells present at time of diagnosis and whether these mutations will um, provide resistance to certain types of therapies. I guess that's now one of the key topics to identify over the next years. Now that we have the technology to look at these individual cells and characterize which mutations occur in which of the cells at diagnosis, now we can also try to um, link this to response to treatment. For example, we have in a recent study identified that in patients with um, high hyperdiploid B cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, a certain subtype of acute lymphoblastic leukemia, that these patients have a diagnosis, many different signaling mutations present in different cells. And some cells in the same patient have a flittery mutation, which is a kinase that drives the proliferation of these cells. But other cells in the same patient had a RAS mutation, which is a very similar type of mutation, but would do slightly different things than the free three mutation. And other cells even had a BRAF mutation, again, another type of mutation. These mutations are all very similar to each other and all drive the proliferation of the cells, but only the cells with the free three mutation would be susceptible to a free three kinase inhibitor and cells with the RAS mutation would be a resistance to a free three kinase inhibitor. So if we would treat those samples or those patients with free three inhibitors in the future, we might expect that the RAS or the BRAF uh, mutant clones might cause relapse or resistance in these patients. And so it's very important now at diagnosis to try to identify all the different mutations that are present and try to predict carefully which of these uh, individuals would benefit from targeted therapies and which types of leukemia may not be uh, good to target with targeted therapies. Very similar studies are ongoing in acute myeloid leukemia and have found also similar things there. So acute lymphoblastic leukemia is definitely very similar to acute myeloid leukemia in that sense, 
that also uh, all these types of acute leukemias are quite heterogeneous at diagnosis. And so to end uh, this part, I just want to focus on um, some of the insights from T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, because T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia is quite different than B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia in the way that we see different types of mutations. So in T-ALL, T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, we often see notch one mutations, which is another oncogene that is driving the proliferation of these cells. And while almost all the T-ALL patients have these notch mutations, also there we see that there is, these mutations are quite heterogeneous at diagnosis. Some cells have notch mutations in the patients, but also the cells do not have notch mutations indicating that these type of mutations, although they are very common in almost all the patients with T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, they're only acquired very late in the disease development. So all the other mutations are first and only at the end, just before the really acute phase of the leukemia is developing, only then these notch mutations are acquired. And that's how we then see different types of mutations. Again, different cells in the same patient acquire different types of notch mutations. That's quite striking and indicates uh, exactly the order at which these mutations occur in these patients. And so for some of these uh, oncogenes, we have a very clear picture now whether they are occurring very early in the disease development or only very late, such as the notch one mutations in TLL are typically more late in the disease uh, development, while other mutations such as the transcription factors that drive the disease in T-cell ALL, but also in B-cell ALL, those mutations are probably very early on and are the driving the initiating events that drive leukemia development. So also by looking carefully to these uh, single cell sequencing data, we can now try to look at which mutations are occurring almost always very early in the disease development and which other mutations are very late. And again, that might give us indications to which of the oncogenes are the most important to target with targeted therapies. Because we typically wanna target all the leukemia cells and so for that, we need to focus on targeting these early mutations that are present in all the cells. Thank you for listening to the ALL Hub podcast. We would also like to thank our supporters, Novartis and Amgen. ALL Hub podcasts brought to you by Scientific Education Support.